Yo, and welcome to uh, the second half of our discussion of the multi-store model of memory. So in the last video, uh, if you'll remember, um, I introduced a couple of things. I introduced this um, multicolored stripe down the side or across the top of some of the slides. And uh, to make it even more professional now, I've decided that at the beginning of uh, each video, I might wear some kind of headwear. Uh, just to somehow differentiate one uh, video from the other. So, so today I've come as a skater. Uh, I hope you like it. It's a, a very solid ProTec helmet uh, with, a very, with a very high level of uh, safety guaranteed. If you ever do go skating, and also don't forget uh, cycling, a helmet is always essential. Okay, let's get kicked off. So, as well as knowing how a model works, as well as being able to explain the, the processes and the stores involved in the multi-store model, the other thing that we need to do if we're going to have a full understanding of it is to be able to ask ourselves, is it convincing? Does it really explain memory very well? And uh, there are sort of a range of questions, a range of evaluation questions that we need to be thinking about. So, for example, do we have evidence? Is, that, is there research that helps us support the theory that the model puts forward? So you might think, have we got research that supports the idea that there are separate memory stores, for example, or research that supports the idea that the duration of um, short-term memory is less than 30 seconds? Uh, another thing that we need to do is, OK, we put forward some research. We say, oh, look, this is what this person found. And then we need to ask ourselves, what is good and what is bad about that research? Is that research convincing? Did they do it properly? Is there anything they've done wrong that would make their um, research not uh, not valid and therefore not helpful? Uh, another point to think about is there might be flaws in the model's explanation. Maybe there are some things that it's missed out that it doesn't really explain very well. We might also think about uh, are there other explanations of memory that can explain the same things only with a, with a better uh, uh, or provide a better explanation for the same things. Uh, and finally, we need, just need to think about overall strengths and weaknesses of the model. So we, we've got, uh, about, at the most I've got, uh, 12 and a bit minutes to do that. I'm going to try and get through a little bit quicker than that, but um, let's see how we go. Okay, so thinking first about is there evidence to support what the model says? Um, first piece of evidence that does support uh, the model was done by Glanzer and Kunitz in 1966 and what they did they read a, a list of words to the participants and asked them to recall as many words as possible they didn't they didn't ask them to recall them in order like we did in some of our experiments they just had to remember them and what Glanzer and Kunitz found that people remembered more words from the start and the end of the list than they did in the in the middle and um, this is how Glanzer and Kunitz explained it. Let's have a look at the next slide. OK, so people remembered more words at the beginning of the list and at the end of the list. And then the ones in the middle were the least well remembered. Now, their argument, and this is the one that supports um, the uh, multi-store model, is that the words at the beginning were, have been heard more or have been uh, because they've been heard first they've been rehearsed more. Okay, So because the words at the beginning have been rehearsed a lot, they've ended up in long-term memory. Um, the words at the end have just been heard, so they're still in short-term memory. And the words in the middle haven't been rehearsed long enough to go into long-term memory, and they're not recent enough to still be in short-term memory. And uh, Glanzer and Kunis calls this the serial position effect. They say depending on what position a word is in the list, if you have it at the beginning or the end, then that's going to be remembered better than any words that you hear in the middle. Um, OK, so that now that's uh, that's a piece of experimental research asking people to remember word lists. OK, now what's good about that is it's done under highly controlled conditions. It's a lab. And because of that, we can be sure that they've taken time to control confounding variables. We can be sure that the IV, 
the position in the word cause the change in the dv the number of times it's been remembered so that's a strength of this and, and that would be something that we would talk about on the other hand we need to ask a question like can we reduce a complex process like memory think of all the things that memory does and things all the things that we do with memory can we reduce that simply to someone's ability to remember word lists um, so that, that's going to be one issue that's going to be an issue of reductionism and then the other issue that we have here is asking ourselves does um, remembering a list of words in the lab is that really what happens in real life memory tasks and um, if we remember when we're asking that question about lab research that's going to be a question of ecological validity okay another piece of research uh, or several pieces of research comes from case studies and there have been several several uh, cases of patients uh, we saw Clive Waring, the uh, the, p the musician and pianist, um, was one that we've seen a couple of videos on. Um, also, there's another guy called H.M., who's probably the most studied, um, he's, well, almost certainly the most studied human being as far as psychology goes. Um, and a third chap called K.F. Now, all of these people uh, suffered brain damage uh, to their hip hippocampus. And uh, this is the hippocampus here. And uh, as a result, uh, their memory their memory loss tends to be selective. Okay, so in other words, that so um, Clive Waring, for example, can remember some things from the past. So he's got some aspects of long term memory, um, old long term memory. He recognised his wife, but he can't create new long term memories. So this supports the idea, therefore, that we have separate memory stores for different types of memory. Now you're probably thinking there's probably a, there's got to be a problem with this as well. Case studies, looking at individuals. Now the strength of a case study uh, uh, is that in actual fact if we just look at one individual and we spend a lot of time with them, investigating them in lots of different ways, we're going to uh, really understand them as individuals. Um, massive amount of information about HM as I've said. However, as we're only studying rare individuals, can we really generalise our findings to everyone else? So that is the, that's the key issue with case studies in general, and it's one that if we're using uh, these case studies to support the multi-store model of memory, we have to ask ourselves, maybe this, um, even though it's strong in some ways, there are real weaknesses with this kind of evidence. Um, brain scanning research is another um, type of research, this is, so this is biological research really, that, that supports um, the idea that uh, we have different memory stores. So these memory, these MRI scans show that for one type of information, for one type of memory, for example, um, a long-term memory task, the hippocampus again is involved, and um, that will light up if you're doing something to do with long-term memory. Whereas if we're making some kind of decision um, about uh, do I use my blue pen or my black pen? Uh, which button do I press on the photocopier? Those kind of things. Um, different parts of our brain light up in the prefrontal lobes when we're using short-term memory. So again, these findings support the idea of um, different memory stores. Okay. Now, the great thing about um, memories. Uh, MRI scans and all those kind of things is that we've got really clear objective evidence of brain activity as in a large number of people so we can look at a picture and say look there we have it um, here is what happens when people are doing these kind of uh, kind of tasks on the other hand a small problem is that even if we can see activity in a particular brain region we don't really necessarily know we can't definitely be sure about what that activity is doing so um, so a part of the brain, just because a part of the brain lights up, that doesn't necessarily mean that that is uh, particularly involved in that function. Okay. Um, in terms of um, flaws in the model's explanation, there are there are some things that the model doesn't explain very well, or is too simple about. So it's, for example, it's too simplistic. Although a model is trying to help us understand things, it can be too simplistic. So, for example, if we look at the uh, short-term memory, 
the idea that it's one store where all sorts of information goes in is um, hard to believe. So for example, uh, we did a couple of tasks in class where we did uh, remembering a phone number and we encoded that information acoustically by saying it to ourselves. Then we did other kinds of uh, short-term memory tasks that involved um, visual memory. So at least we would probably think uh, that there might be two types of short-term memory store. Um, Long-term memory could be divided up as well. We might remember um, different kind of things in long-term memory. We might remember what happened on our birthday uh, five years ago. Or we might remember um, uh, what happened when we were at a party last week. Those are episodic memories that we remember episodes from our lives. That's one type of long-term memory. We can also think about um, poem, a poem that we had to learn when we were at primary school or a, or a hymn or whatever. If we remember those still, um, those are called semantic memories. And that's very different. Remembering a poem is very different from remembering what happened. Uh, also, if you can ride a bike or you know, a skateboard like I, like I do regularly, then we remember the procedures that are involved. So... Uh, um, that's a different type of um, long-term memory again. Also, in the in the multi-store model, it suggests that the only way information goes from long-term memory, short-term memory, into long-term memory is through verbal rehearsal, saying things over and over again. And that's a bit well. Everyone thinks from nowadays that that is oversimplified. There are some things that we might find in our long-term memory without ever even being aware that we've re um, rehearsed it. So if, I, if someone asked you, what did you have for breakfast this morning? You haven't actually um, uh, you haven't actually rehearsed it or said it over to yourself in your head, but you can still recall it. And that is a problem for the, the multi-store model. Another problem is the, this whole idea of short-term memory and long-term memory are relying on one another. And we saw that when we, when we did uh, the idea of chunking. So when, if we see the, the letters GCSE, that's not four pieces of information, that's one piece of information. But it only is a, um, we only know that it's one piece of memory if we've already got the idea of a GCSE um, in our long term memory. So it's th the idea of them being separate stores may be an issue. Um, something else that we that we can use and you can come back to and use is this whole idea of different explanations of memory. So, for example, the levels of processing a model of memory can explain how long-term memories are created without using the idea of rehearsal. Okay, and we can add more when we get to that model. On the other hand, uh, it's the first comprehensive model that we've had. Um, where people have tried to explain the whole of the memory process from the moment we hear something right through to remembering it 50 years later. Um, and the model has actually generated a whole lot of research. So all the other research that we actually read about is often based on um, some of the claims and the explanations that we see in uh, the multi-store model. Okay, so what you need to do now is that you need to go back over um, I would uh, have a look at your Cornell notes, make a summary of uh, the kind of um, evaluation points that we've discussed. Uh, and once you've made your summary, then I would actually start looking um, to see if there are any questions that you need to ask yourself. And then maybe have a go at testing yourself before we see you in class. All the material that's on here is going to be incredibly useful um, because it's going to form the basis of the first essay. Um, that you're going to be writing for uh, PY4, which in itself is quite an exciting thing. And uh, I'm really looking forward to reading your first attempts at this, uh, this whole new essay style. Okay, thanks for listening. I'll see you in class.